Hello everyone, welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank for the Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck Part 4, The Raider of Copper Hill. So here we are in the year 1884. Edison's light bulb is finally coming in. But from Scrooge's perspective and life, his life as a cowpoke, as a cattle rancher, is coming to an end. As the Sea of Grass, which, you know, people like Myrtle McKenzie used to graze cattle, is slowly being cut down. So it's it's shrinking due to homesteads being built by people coming to America. So he has no choice but to, you know, head back to Texas for his ranches, and he's got to let everybody go. But Scrooge is sort of all right with this, or Buck, as, he's, as he will be called for one of the last times in his life. He said, like, you know what? It's fine. I'll become a prospector. And he just starts digging in the ground. He's like, you know what? I'll find gold or silver. And when he takes it to the to the assay office, I really hope I said that right. This is like, no, dude, not gold, not silver, copper. You got pennies, Jim. You got pennies. And Scrooge just sort of, sort of where it hits him. I think he really sort of thought, you know, like, I'll just go to the next thing. And here I go. And it's nothing. So Scrooge then goes to a diner, or just a restaurant to eat, and he meets a man by the name of Marcus Daly. I hope I said that one right, too. And Marcus Daly is a rather important figure in, well, not really American history, but in American industry. He was one of he was one of the three copper kings of Montana, and at this point, he tried to get a bunch of friends to, well, just, you know, some, some investors to go in with him on a silver mine. And by the time they got to, they appraised it and look at it it was silver it was copper and you think that would still be good but it's also too deep down effectively he bought a hill and no matter it will take a lot it takes a lot of money to get enough equipment to dig all the way down there to get copper there's no value in copper until they find out that edison has done something new a few years ago edison had brought electricity to new york now he's brought it to Montana. They enjoy three hours of electricity, which by today's standard sounds actually like really draconian, but this is sort of the best that can be done. And what happens is they realize, well, no, they need wire and they need copper. And so much of it is needed, the prices will skyrocket. This is like, I think, one of the another moment where Scrooge is introduced to the world of business and how things work. The importance of seeing what people need and seeing ahead. Because if Scrooge had known this, he'd have probably kept digging for copper and just been totally set now, but he didn't. And when Marcus and Scrooge find out, they're like, copper? Okay, I know I can dig copper. Marcus like, I'm sitting on a mountain of it. And that thus begins the great copper prospector race that is Scrooge McDuck's life. After selling his, after selling Captain Seafoam McDuck's gold teeth to purchase equipment, he creates a mobile homestead so when most people prospected around 1884 and before it was understood that you owned land as long as you lived on it you know barring anyone else ever actually having you know physical documentation of it so what Scrooge has done instead of like, taking the time to build a house he's built effectively just an outhouse that he can just tell that he can just carry around with his horse however the problem with this is that Scrooge has no idea exactly how to dig for anything. He doesn't know how to be a prospector. This is something that the life and times of Scrooge McDuck actually excels at doing is explaining how Scrooge knows things, or well, most things. Whereas the DuckTales series, both the 87 and the 2017 version, have sort of given us the idea that Scrooge just knows things. And we have to imply this from experience. But at least the 87 version, what I think was a bit better explaining that, where the 2017 version is sort of setting up Scrooge as this already well-traveled adventurer. Like, it's hard to tell exactly when Scrooge became rich in the 2017 version. But as Scrooge is struggling to sort of make it here, the Anaconda Copper Mine is busting. It's just busting with business because, well, copper's in demand, so Marcus can get all the money he wants to dig for it, and at this at this point, the Anaconda Copper Mine becomes known as the richest hill on earth. And Scrooge is a bit despondent about it, and one day, he's met by a relatively rich-looking duck. And he says, like, is that the Anaconda Copper Mine over there? And Scrooge says, well, yes, sir, that's it. And it's frustrating to think there's so much copper over there and not over here. And the duck says, well, you know what, just keep at it, lad. Someday you'll be rich just like I did. And we find out that this person has really, you know, disappointing family members. His wife is a snob. His son's a spoiled brat. 
and they just sort of go off without him after his son Johnny calls Scrooge a grubby workman that he'll get cooties from it when Howard responds well with you know I was once a grubby workman too they just sort of leave him and Scrooge just sort of wants to know like you used to be a prospector and he goes yes sir my name is Howard Rockaduck he struck it rich in the gold rush of 49 and Scrooge says I'm gonna do that too and Howard says I doubt it judging by the oil streaks you're digging in the wrong direction and you swing that pick like a school marm. and Scrooge sort of calls him out you think you can do better he's like I bet I can and Howard does better. He takes his coat off, takes his hat off, undoes his tie a bit, and he just goes into that dirt, and it's awesome. And about half an hour later, they come across a copper vein. According to Scrooge, it's it's a bit thin. It's not it's not a super strong vein. Like it might only go for a little bit. But screw but Howard says, Well, it looks like it's connected to the Anaconda Copper Mine. So Howard says, I'm gonna teach you one more thing. So they go into town and when they're in town, Scrooge is met with sort of an almost low-key, low-budget Beauty and the Beast sort of reading. Except, you know, everyone just says, hi, Scrooge, how you doing, Scrooge? What's up, Scrooge? And Howard's like, everyone here is super friendly, super friendly, as they go to the assay office. And the, the man at the office comes out and says that the sample of copper he tests is 55%, the same as the Anaconda Copper Mine. Scrooge is sort of thinking, okay, that and a nickel get me a cup of coffee. But Howard's like, no, no, shut up. We're going into the uh, we're going to the judge's office. And as he's being pulled in, a bunch of people are like, is that guy giving Scrooge trouble? No, no, no. Whatever, whatever he said, we'll vouch for you, Scrooge. And uh, Howard drags Scrooge into the courthouse, and he says, like, hey, we need a ruling because this man's land, on his land, the Anaconda Copper Vein is only five feet deep. So Scrooge only has to dig five feet to reach the Anaconda Copper Vein. The judge asks, why is that a big deal? And he says, because of the Apex Law of 1849, whoever owns land where the ore vein is closest to the surface owns the entire vein. Scrooge McDuck owns the Anaconda Copper Mine. And that is actually really intense. It's actually pretty, it's a pretty messed up ruling, but it makes some degree of sense. Whoever can reach it first by default should get it. And because the Anaconda Copper Mine is on, is a huge hill, they have to dig from all, probably at least a couple miles to get to, well, probably not miles. That's an exaggeration, but Scrooge only has to dig five feet on his claim. So according to Howard, Scrooge has to be the only person there. The only person who can say that I own this copper mine, I own this land to be ruled as the owner. So if anyone else is there, it's contested again. So you got to get down there. Luck, fortunately, for the sake of story, the entire town of Butte heard this, and they're all running to Scrooge's claim. Scrooge isn't having it. He goes after them, where Howard gets the judge and his books ready because the judge has to find the law to make sure. Blah blah blah. And that's when it gets awesome. This is what makes Part Four one of my personal favorites. Not my all-time favorite. That's actually possibly the next one. As Scrooge engages with these men. And the narration is brilliant. First of all, the image is just intense. Just Scrooge fighting all these dudes. But as it says, at that moment, several dozen of Butte's meanest miners, cowpokes, tanners, waddies, and various other, various and sundry ne'er-do-wells are learning they're no match for the last of the clan McDuck. Not when he's mad. And he's just going through these dudes like, oh my god. he's He swings one dude. And he ends up hitting four other dudes. All right. He kicks one cart, hits three dudes, about to hit a fourth. I'm like, oh, well, I got one dude is picking up all of his teeth. One guy just looks confused. Like, how did he get to at the top of the panel? And so the battle effectively ends with a stick of dynamite, not courtesy of Scrooge, but it ends. And Scrooge finds himself the only, the last man standing and is declared the owner of the Anaconda Copper Mine. Scrooge is then met by Marcus Daly, who had no idea what was going on, had no idea that his that his copper mine had just been stolen from underneath him, and Howard says, How Marcus, guess what? This young man just gained the right to our copper mine. And it's like, what? Howard Howard has a stake in the copper mine, then why'd he do this? And Howard says that I'm rich enough by default. Like this is isn't that big a deal. Like, yeah, it's a big investment, but I'm not going under for it. And he says it would do my John good to, you know, not inherit so much wealth that he didn't earn himself. And 
that's another interesting thing about this. Howard just sort of latched on to Scrooge's industrious nature, his hardworking attitude. It almost feels like Howard views Scrooge as the son that he wanted. Like he really wanted his son John to be like Scrooge. And it's interesting because John will become John Rockerduck who will be one of Scrooge's enemies, not in the U.S. Like, in the U.S., most people have no idea who John Rockerduck is. But in in Italy, in other parts of Europe, uh, John Rockerduck is very popular. But anyway, uh, they go to get you know, more paperwork done, blah, blah, blah. But before they do, Marcus Daly offers Scrooge a check for $10,000 for his claim because Marcus is fairly certain that his lawyers will get that ruling overturned. Okay, but while that's happening... The mine has to be shut down. That's lost money. So let's just go for a payout and be done with it. So as Scrooge heads back into town, he figures you know he figures he'll be greeted the same way. You know, not everyone there was you know fighting Scrooge, and even if they were, like you know, it was still his land. But everyone just sort of giving him the cold shoulder. They're sort of sort of treating him like an outcast, like he doesn't matter. They don't like him anymore. It's like he's rich now. Oh, you suck. And Scrooge's like, well, what did I do? And Howard says, nothing. You became rich. You'll have their respect, but no longer their love. And the look on Howard's face sort of implies this happened a lot. Like, you know, how many people just sort of give up on you or just are done with you because you've become something more successful? This is sort of the other side of celebrity culture, too. There are people that just like to tear you down because you're successful. You know, we call them haters now, but haters isn't a new thing. And Scrooge doesn't seem to mind, but Howard, Howard seems to be a bit off-put by it. He's saying, I hope I wasn't wrong about you, son. And this is something I think Scrooge is sort of aware of, but isn't quite prepared for. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt told him in part three, you know, um, Bucker with the Badlands, the great men lead lonely lives. And I think Scrooge is sort of resolved to be okay with that. But at the same time, he doesn't quite get it. I think Scrooge is so focused on his journey that he's not quite ready or aware of what it's going to cost him. And we'll see what it costs him. I mean, it's, this isn't a foreign concept, even to doc, even to purely cartoon fans of the 87 version. Scrooge doesn't have any actual friends that don't personally know, that don't personally work for him. Launchpad works for him, Gyro works for him, Fenton works for him, Mrs. Beakley, Duckworth. And that isn't to say they aren't his friends. But think about them. Those are all friends from relatively the past few years of his life before he would really come to live with him. And we have, what was it... The Duck and the Iron Mask show like Scrooge's only other friend, but we're sort of deviating. So Scrooge is relatively happy. He's met but with a telegram, though, to sort of change everything. It's from his father, and his father says, you have to come down here. Castle McDuck is in danger. Bring money. Sincerely, Fergus McDuck. And Scrooge, he's a bit upset. He's a bit upset because his it's sort of like the first response, like, I just got a hold of my dream, and now I have to get, get rid of it. And... Howard says it seems like your family needs you, so you should go. And it doesn't seem like Scrooge needed that, but it was more like a quick reminder that his family does need him. So he says, tell Marcus I'll take the check. And that's how the comic ends with Scrooge getting ready to go to back to Glasgow. And honestly, this was a really great issue. It's actually one of my favorites, uh, as I said before. There's a lot happening here. There's not a little, this is the adventure of the week that felt like um, the Master of the Mississippi and Buckley with the Badlands felt. This felt more like we're directly dealing with Scrooge in a way that the other two didn't. The other two sort of went, hey, this is Scrooge learning under someone. And he goes on an adventure that leads to him meeting people that will influence him later. Or rather, people that will share a connection with him in the future. Mash in the Sippy had the Beagle Boys. Um, Buck with the Badlands has the Dalton Brothers who will be important later on. But... It was also felt like you've got to learn how to do, how to think effectively. You know, Buck with the Badlands taught him the importance of hard work. And here, he has a sort of different mentor here in Howard. Howard sort of sees Scrooge as a, another, a younger version of himself, or who he used to be. And he wants to help that, but he also wants to give him important advice. And that's sort of it. With that in mind, we'll bring this video to a close here. If you're new to the Bucket Thing, feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Feel free to check out some of the other videos on my channel. If you have read the, the Raider of Copper Hill, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tank signing off. May your fandom serve you well.